Praise the Lord, everybody. We believe because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, we have a legacy of love, grace to do greater works, and faith to see the unseen hand of God at work. Amen. You may be seated tonight as we're going to go through several scriptures. So I hope you're ready to either um, type them into your phone or if you are ready to write them down. Amen. And so we praise and we bless God on tonight and we um, want to go right into the word of the Lord going right into the word we're still talking about scarcity surplus and supply scarcity surplus and supply and tonight there are three areas that we're going to break down in particular three areas and so if you're writing or if you're typing um, if those of you who want to type in the chat tonight one of the areas that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about clarity versus clutter, clarity versus clutter, hoarding versus harvest, hoarding versus harvest. And then we're gonna talk about stingy versus success, stinginess versus success. So again, those are clutter versus clarity, hoarding versus harvest, and stinginess versus success. So as we're continuing in our series, if you're joining us for the first time, again, I wanna welcome you here. But if you are um, joining us for the first time tonight, we're, we've been in a series that I want to urge everybody to go back and really look at this series as we are possibly in for a famine. And with that, we want to be prepared because God's people know that God specializes in things impossible. And so we serve a God who is more than enough. He says in Exodus that I am that I am. So those of you wanting to come out of debt, you're going to want to really be in this series and understand if you're wanting to learn how do I put up for a famine? How do I prepare? It's not in our hoarding. So it becomes then necessary that we understand that although we hear these things, we do not have to have clutter in our lives. We don't have to have hoarding in our lives. The scripture tells us that the bird or the fowl of the air don't worry about what it is that they're going to eat on tomorrow because they know that if God has provided for them today, that God is going to continue to provide for them such as they need. So in Matthew 6, we see the disciples prayer. It says, give us this day our daily bread because there is uh, there is an expectation that on a daily basis that we're going to listen for God, that we're going to expect that we have a level of expectation that God is going to be God in our lives. So with that level of expectation that we're believing that we're going to see, we're believing that God is going to provide everything that we need. God is going to provide everything that we need. So we have to look at mental health, the thing that drives us. So if we're going to talk from our first point tonight, which is going to be clarity versus clutter, we have to be clear about giving. We have to be clear about doing. On Sunday, I touched it just a smidgen and I backed out of it. We were talking about the high priest, the priest, and then we talked about the Levites. When you look at the Levites, they were given over to more than just preaching. They were given over to more than just ushering. It is being concerned about the things of God outside of the pulpit, outside of the choir stand, outside of Sunday and Wednesday. It is lending of yourself, giving of your talents, and your time in the word. So this is what we see in there's a misnomer in that, or shall I say a misunderstanding because a lot of people think that the Levites were just people that came in and they were just at the altar all the time and they were just praying and they were just doing this. But you had your high priest and you had your priest who were given over to those things. So the Levitical priesthood, it still is part of the priesthood, is the work that goes beyond preaching, the work that goes beyond praying, the work that goes beyond uh, prophesy. It is the work that must carry over daily, that daily management that has to be a part of being a good 
steward over the things that God has given unto us. If we're going to bless our community, then we must be good stewards over the things. If we're intending to receive blessings from God. Uh, my dad used to say to my sister all the time, you'll never get another car until you learn how to keep the car that you have clean. If you don't know how to manage what God has given unto you, if you don't manage what you have, how can you then have a plausible expectation for God to do something else in your lives? So it is not just what we're going to acquire and what we're going to bring in, but God, how am I managing what I already have? And I, I, I bet if we find out and if we really manage what we have and we get a good hold and a good feel on what we already have, we will stop wasting. We will discover that we have more because remember when God, when, when, whenever in the scripture, God really had people to look and they start the woman with the, um, with the, the cruise of oil. Remember, it was the cruise of oil that kept giving. It wasn't that God gave her more. It was what she already had. Come on here, somebody. So when we look at the, 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 when we look at Jesus feeding with the fish and the loaves of bread, it was not that God said, there it is. No, he took what was already there. Somebody said, what's already there? And so we don't have to get our mindset out of this to say, I'm going to go by this. I'm going to go by that. But what is it that I already possess? What is it that we already have that God wants to work in that. I was cleaning up around the church on yesterday and I was noticing that we had certificate paper over here. We had long sheets of paper over there. But when we become better stewards and we start to organize, and not have so much clutter here and there and everywhere. But when we organize, we can get a better grip on what we have. Some of those certificates were bought over and over again because we forgot where we put them the last time. But when we organize and we have a place for everything, say everything has a place. You and I have a place. When we get in our places, when we put things in their rightful places, they tend to work best for us. Anybody other than me ever gone to the store before and you bought something only to get home and discover a few days later that you already have it, but it wasn't in a place where it probably should have been? And so we, what we want to do is rediscover what we already have. Find contentment in what we have. So we. this is why this part of this series is so important so that we are clear. So we want to be clear. What is that we have already? You know, we, we, were, uh, we were looking and we found where we had files that were over here and files that were over there. Well, we'll start to think that we don't have the information we need when it's time for it. But we really have all we need. We just got to take it, combine it, put it back where it needs to be and we are sturdy. So we want to, this is, a, this is the time where I'm urging everybody is to take inventory. We want to take inventory. What is it that I have? What do I, because we think we need what we don't need until we take full inventory to say, what do I have? And let me tell you what comes when you, uh, when you start to assessing what you have, you can now get a game plan that you're not wasting. There's that word waste again. You're not wasting your time, which is your most precious commodity to go to the grocery store to rebuy it. Or you're not wasting time to redo an assignment that is already done. You just forgot that it was there or to, you know, we hear this said all the time, reinvent the wheel. So we, we start to gain our time back when we take inventory. We start to realize what we really have. It also gives us greater grounding for gratitude. Because when I can take inventory of what I have, I become more grateful having rediscovered what was already there. I can say, thank you, Lord. Look what I already have. I don't have need to go to Walmart today. Some, of, some people, they just go to the store day after day after day after day, and they don't realize the waste that it takes um, in time and the waste that it takes in fuel if you're driving there the time, the fuel, and the cost of us not taking inventory. So putting things in order and really taking full inventory, what is it that we have? Uh, really taking inventory for uh, um, for not just insurance purposes, but we, we, we have to look and we have to start to reassess again. What's on our list? What are the things that we have gathered over the last couple of years that now we need to put on an inventory list? Insurance companies required, but what about for assurance? The assurance that God we have and that we're sturdy. So the Bible also talks about a blessed assurance. 
being assured that we are sturdy for the work that God has for us. We say that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. Well, the just have got to live by faith that when God makes that wealth transfer, that we are candidates for it. But if God doesn't see that we're stewarding what we already have, if God doesn't see that we appreciate and that we are acting in regard as the Levites to make sure that the things of the kingdom of God, that means that we got to get out of just the church having mentality. We got to have mindsets that every day is a day that that we're looking to steward well the kingdom of God. But you won't do that if your mindset is not right. So you have to start having clarity versus clutter. A lot of the times our minds are cluttered. It's cluttered with things that we need to just say, you know what? I need to be still in the presence of God. Have you ever found yourself or found someone that they were just moving around? Have you ever looked to say, but what was, uh, how productive have I been? Movement is not impressive to God. Not at all. Because movement without producing anything, God is looking at how much we have produced. What are we producing? What is it that we're really getting accomplished? Really saying at the end of our day, Lord, I want to take inventory of how I have stewarded that day. But you will not do that until you see time as a steward. We can fool one another because some of us have the need to be needed. Some of us have the need to look busy. And so we can fool ourselves and fool one another, but we can never fool God. Amen. Because God is looking for the fruit. And September, I always talk about fruit because it's the ninth month. And so, you know, we start talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Well, the fruit of the Spirit are those things that ground us, gives us patience so that we are going at the pace of grace as we do the work of God. Gives us, gives us that long-suffering period and understanding that there will be times of long-suffering, but gives us that spirit to be able to be kind while we wait and so and it, it just goes on and on mayo clinic um gives us some things and it talks about hoarding so hoarding and cluttering kind of go together but clarity has to come to the mindset that means that you have to sit down sometimes take out a take what's in the mind and put it on paper and have a plan what does Habakkuk 2 says it says write the vision and make it plain you may have an overall vision for your life but I want to encourage you to get a vision plan for your day really sitting and saying this is what I have to do this is what I have to do today this is what I'm going to have to do tomorrow really getting that vision plan really getting that vision plan I'm going to ask somebody to help him by giving him something to eat but really getting that vision plan and putting it in place amen, amen. making sure that we have a vision for our day something that we say okay God this is the top of my day and God with this day I want to make sure that I'm stewarding well this day I can have a plan to do what I want to do but if that's not what's in the plan of God not getting all twisted and bent out of shape just because my day is not going the way I want it to go. But taking inventory in the middle of the day to say, God, did you orchestrate this meeting? Sometimes what seems inconvenience is not inconveniencing us at all. What it really is, is it's a shift from our personal plan into the plan of God. So really understanding what it is. Psalm 23 and 1, write this down. Psalm 23 and 1. Psalm 23 and 1. In the King James Version, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But when I make myself my shepherd, I start working overtime when I ought to be in Bible study. I start working overtime when I should be at home with my children. I start working overtime when I should be blessing my, my family. I'm doing things that I have no business doing. And so, because I think that I'm the one that's making this work, and now, God, now I'm overwhelmed, and now I'm frustrated, and now my job becomes a God for me. And now my job becomes priority over God, and sometimes over myself, and sometimes over my family, because I'm putting in more hours. Instead of saying, God, did I accomplish for you today what I needed to accomplish here? But when I go into the workspace with this mindset, then I have a mindset that whatever it is that I accomplish today, then it is well. 
What we have to realize, my grandmother used to say this to her sister all the time, and it's biblical. She would say, um, and, and you know, they would see each other every now and then, and we would take her over, my grandmother over to Bossier City to visit with her sister. And the day prior to, she'd always call her, her sister, and she'd say to her, I'll see you tomorrow if I live and don't die, and if the Lord says the same because we should never get in the mindset that just because we're here today that we're going to be here on tomorrow a lot of people look and they say oh well they were young but there are children with childhood cancer that's why we support St. Jude because there are children that got all kinds of things and they're dying I was sharing with a gentleman today that shared how his friend played football had a stroke yesterday 40 years old and he's not here today so we're praying for that family just because we're standing just just because we're here, here today does not mean that God has to be gracious to give us tomorrow. So that means that what I can do for God today, not for my job, not for myself, but what can I do for God today? That if I'm not here tomorrow, I, and let me tell you, what you do for God is the best thing that you can do for yourself. If you're on that job, and you, you take the opportunity to say that, you know, today I'm going to be here. And if you've got to stop at your break time to pray for somebody, just don't, don't worry about that because God may have orchestrated you running into that person. So the Lord is my shepherd. That means that I'm not in control of my life. I'm expecting that wherever he leads in God, I'm a sheep. I'm going to follow in with God. The Lord is my shepherd. And now you can say, but if the Lord is not your shepherd, we want to quote the B part without understanding the A part. If you are leading yourself, thou fool, if you are leading yourself, if you are saying that I'm going to go into this day the way that I want to go into this day, it'll be what I want to do, then you don't have a right to the B part of Psalm 23 and 1. Psalm 23 and 1 says, I shall not want, but I shall not want when the Lord is my shepherd. That's how that goes. When the Lord is my shepherd, I'm not going to want for anything. I'll have everything that I need. So when we start talking about this clutter and clarity, that means that we have got to look at mental disorders and our habits. We don't want to look at ourselves. We don't want to take it. We don't want to take inventory of where our minds are. And a lot of times we're here and there and everywhere. You got to learn how to declutter. You got to declutter not your spaces before you can declutter your spaces and pull yourself in to what is it that God wants me to do today. Sometimes that takes some time to get your mind right, to empty up and to say, God, what is it that you want me to do today? That means that I got to write some stuff down before I go to bed so I'm not settling with that stuff on my mind. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. And I'm going to give it to you in the New IV or the New International Version. That's 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. It says here, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. This is why I don't believe in $100 lines. Because I may not have had $100 in my heart. And that's why after you give the $100, if it's not in your heart, it is not prospering you anything. We have um, assessments, and we know clearly assessments from offering. Assessments are those things that we say, it's church anniversary, so we're going to give $100 to be a blessing. And it's clear that that's not our offering. But when we're talking about the tithe and the offering, it says each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly. That means that you don't want to do it or you got a bad attitude about doing it. That's when you shouldn't do it. Or not under compulsion where you feel forced. Some of us may feel forced or we may feel, and sometimes when you feel forced to do something, you're uncomfortable about the work that you do. So we have to go back and we have to say, what makes me feel uncomfortable about this? It may be something that someone's done to you or something that you need to challenge yourself and look and say, God, why do I not like doing this? What's going on with me? And then go deeper because that may be a point where you and God can reach a place of clarity. There, there have been jobs that I've gone to, and it was just like, I don't really want to go. I had to show up. But what, who was I benefiting by being there? I'm not benefiting anybody if I show up 
to do a job or to do work and nobody really wants to work with anybody who shows up and doesn't want to be there so the scripture says not reluctantly meaning that somebody's got to pull your teeth somebody's got to worry about you and tiptoe around you and wonder if you want to give you know your children shouldn't have to approach you scared about asking for something if your children are afraid to ask for something that's when you have to go back and say what have i done to make my children feel this way because we can go boldly before the throne of god and that parent-child relationship is to be that which demonstrates to us how we're to relate to the heavenly father and so we want to make sure we i understand respect but we have to tear down those walls we have to tear down those walls that make people afraid and fearful of us because we're not to fear anybody but God. So when there's something there, we got to look at it. We got to put it out on the table and say, why do I feel this way? What has been going on in my life that I need to change the way that I'm looking at? That's getting clarity mentally, right? And so not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a what? A cheerful giver. If you're showing up and you're just, uh, let me do, I don't want, and let me tell you, I don't want to eat a meal that somebody didn't want to cook it. If you don't feel like cooking today, then why, you might poison me. And you're wondering why it's a little salty this time, or it doesn't have enough seasoning in it, perhaps because that person didn't feel like cooking that day. So sometimes we have to learn and recognize when people are having a tough time and say to them, I got it today. I got it. In our families, in our marriages, and so forth and so on. Sometimes we got to say, I know you don't feel like it today. Or, you know, sometimes we may have to articulate that and say, I'm just not feeling it today. So can I, can I skip on this today and do something else? And we have to learn how to be uh, emotionally intelligent. We talked about that a couple of months ago. Being emotionally intelligent to say, you know what? I give you grace. I recognize and realize you had a tough day. Why don't you take it? Why don't you have a seat? And, 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 but, because now that person's not involved in a task, doing it reluctantly. They're not involved in a task, doing it without cheerfulness. Because God wants us to be what? Cheerful givers. He wants us to show up. What if I come to church and I'm an usher and I'm ushering somebody into the presence of God? So it is, but I've got the worst attitude in the world. That's Sunday you don't need to usher. That's Sunday you don't. If you don't, if you're handling finance and you and you don't, if you're negative and you don't believe that God can work a miracle, you don't need to handle finance. If you're a preacher and you don't believe in healing, you don't need to talk about healing. If you're praying and you don't believe that it's going to happen, you don't need to pray. You need to be prayed for. You need to be preached to. Come on here. You need to be ushered into the presence yourself. And so we have to understand and get clear about where we are. And there's nothing wrong with recognizing that you're the person that needs a little bit more clarity. Because we all have to take that inventory. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Let's go. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 in the New International Version says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where the moths and the vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. We're in the, we're in the time of social media. And I've never seen so many people, they get a new car, they got to prop up against that car and take that picture. And you're wondering, why did the thief come to my house? Are they gone on vacation and they're you know, given their location and the thieves are just at their houses because you put so much on social media to tell the world what you have, but you won't tell the people that Jesus is Lord to the saving of their souls. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where the moths and the vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, here it is, this is what I want you to see. Where your treasure, this is in the same chapter that we got the disciples prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He says, I don't want you to store those treasures up in the earth. You got to store them up in the heavens. He says for, the word says, for where your treasure is, where your treasure is, there is where your heart is going to be. But if your treasure is at the racetrack if your treasure is at the boat if your treasure is 
is if your treasure is on your job, then you're not going to have a treasure for Christ. So guess what? You won't have anything stored up in heaven. You'll be getting all of yours right here and right now. This will be the only time that you'll get it. So we have to ask ourselves, where's, where's our treasure? I often um, recommend when we're talking about finances that you look and you take the different colors and you highlight and you, you, you get your end of the month statement, print it out and highlight and put your categories and say, where did I spend money? Did I spend, did I live out of my void or did I live out of my value this month? How many bills did I pay? Could I have paid that bill or paid extra on that bill if I wasn't living out my void and, were, and buying tennis shoes that I didn't need or buying extra food that when I got home, I really found that if I'd gone a little bit deeper into the freezer and sometimes it's a lack of preparation and we want to get mad at everybody else because we didn't prepare. I've learned, uh, I remember when I was under the leadership of Bishop Brandon, Bishop Brandon would ask me for something the first time. If I didn't have it the first time, he wasn't going to ask me a second time and I didn't have it. Because I was going to learn, as I was learning his leadership style, I was going to learn how, I was going to learn his spirit. And I was going to learn what that functionality was. And I was going to be paying attention to understand how in the world can I add to this i look at my pastor i look at pastor scott and i say how how can i support the ministry of pastor scott how can i support what he has going on and support my pastor in that area why am i saying this i'm saying this because when we get we can be become clear we are now prepared we're prepared and so what that would teach me those things would be become a lesson i may have sometimes i would have to scurry to get things done but I wasn't going to have to get in a hurry again about that thing because I was going to be prepared for how to operate in that. So preparation is very important. So when we're talking about scarcity, surplus, and supply, you don't get surplus where there's scarcity if you don't have preparation. You've got to have some preparation. That's where your budget and writing the vision comes in for your money. That's why your day... The reason you don't have to worry about what's going to happen to me today, because I've already decided that this is the day that the Lord has made. It belongs to God. I'm going to rejoice in it, come what may, no matter what. I left my shoes today. I had to go back and get my shoes. I remember a time I would have been frustrated about that, upset, but I said, you know what? There's a reason for it. And so it ended up being that I got home, got a package, got the package, had to go to the post office to have a conversation because I don't go to that particular post office. and so, But the, I needed to have that conversation today that was not on my agenda this morning. So with me, it, it had to be that you're going to have to have a reason to go back. So I bless God that I forgot my shoes this morning. So are we missing the opportunity to see God operating on our day? Or are we so frustrated and so negative Nancy, negative Nathaniel, that we don't see the miracle of God in the mix of our day. So you have to get your mindset. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, something that starts when people are really in their teenage years because something happens in the mind to trigger them that they're not gonna have enough. Um, or, you know, just excessive clutter. Sometimes that begins here. And if you if you don't see that and pull that out, then pe those are folks who have trouble getting rid of things. Then you have to deal with perfectionism. A lot of people with perfectionism, I got to have it just in case. I got to have it just in case. You got to believe God for every case. You got to get out of the just in case mentality and say for every case in my life, I've got to learn how to trust God. So in that chapter of Matthew 6, we see that he gives us the disciples' prayer, which talks about our daily bread. Then he tells us where our treasures ought to be, where your treasures ought to be locked up. So um, there's something called CBT or cognitive behavior therapy that we use to help people who have behavioral disorders. It's CPT, cognitive behavior. Are we cognizant as a church, as a people, of how we tend to the kingdom of God? Are we cognizant of what we have and have in supply? You heard me interrupt the sermon because there was a gentleman who was walking up just a minute ago and he comes by frequently when, when he needs something to eat. But what if we did not have in the fellowship hall 
while we're here, something for him and quickly. And immediately the ministers went out and they were right back in because we have what's necessary. That means we got to be prepared. We can't wait until somebody's hungry and say, next time we're going to have it. No, the first time somebody comes and they're hungry and you don't have it, that means you keep the supply with the expectation that we are fulfilling what God will have us to fulfill in his kingdom and being ready to provide because in the time of famine, the church is going to be in charge of the surplus. There's no scarcity in the great I am. He says that I am that I am. So it's our job to make sure that there's no scarcity. Scarcity is a fear tactic of the enemy. And this world will know scarcity in famine, but we will know a great God. He will be made famous in the famine because we will stand and we will have what it takes to be able to give and say, you know what? We've got surplus. We've got supply because God is supplying all of our needs according to his great riches and glory. Because we would have stored up a treasure and the windows of heaven will be pouring out to us. God has even given us wisdom about how to handle ministry. We understand now we're we're in a season of pivoting and transition right now in Grace Hill Church because we understand that the hour calls for something very different. And we have to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar. That's what the word of God says. So there's an aspect that, that the IRS says has to happen. There's some things that we have to do and we have to answer. But the Bible says you provide an honest answer in all things. So we make sure that we have a, a spirit of integrity. But that comes by being organized and prepared. You can't have the clutter. You got to you gotta know what it is that you're dealing with, right? right. So let's move on to hoarding and versus our harvest hoarding versus our harvest sometimes the reason that we're not clearing out that clutter and clarity is because we're avoiding something sometimes we don't want to we, we avoid that room so we put that stuff away even in the rolodex of our minds sometimes there's a place in our heads that we just don't move into that room in our head or our heart people got places in their heart that they don't move into because it's hurt and if they ever deal with that past pain and ever really face it, they can get rid of it. We live a life, and I tell people when I'm counseling with them, we live a life of repression rather than progression. In order for you, people tell me, well, I don't want to deal with that. Well, why did you come see me? If you don't want to deal with that, because this is the place for that it has to come up. And so we spend our lives, something comes up familiar, and we're pushing it down and we're suppressing and then we wonder why we're running here and there and we're not getting anything accomplished is because we spend our day exhausting ourselves on um, pushing that thing down mentally we're mentally worn we're mentally tired so when it comes to do the work that we're supposed to be doing for god and for our families we can't do it because we're exhausted our sleep is interrupted because even in our sleep we're not restful because we refuse to deal with that thing so avoidance mayo clinic talks about that procrastination not getting things done so then you know we just find ourselves on that hamster wheel we're going we're moving but we're not making that progress right so let's look at hoarding versus harvest ecclesiastes 5 13 through 14 ecclesiastes 5 13 through 14 ecclesiastes 5 13 through 14 there's another serious problem i have seen under the sun hoarding riches harms the savior this is the new living translation money is put into risky inve investments that turn sour and everything is lost in the end there is nothing left to pass on to one's children that's in the scripture that's in the scripture that wasn't me talking so it says here there's another serious problem i i have seen under the sun so solomon is telling us that we're hoarding riches and it harms the saver saver the person who's saving that stuff back it's so and then expiration dates things are expiring but what are we leaving for our children putting this stuff into risky investments we 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 why would you trust nasdaq and all that stuff and not and not trust god trusting god to bring the tithe into the storehouse that there'll be meat in the house of the lord but we'll put our investments out there in other places the bible says the bible says that that stuff turns sour and everything is lost i'm not telling you that investments are not something that you need to do like your 401 but make sure that you're a tither and giving unto God, then you give those investments. We we recommend that investments be at least 12 to 15 percent. 
You can give 12 to 15 percent, but God's only asking you for 10 percent. And the, and the reason you have, let me say this, the reason that you got to give, let me talk about the tithe for a minute, because this revelation came to me and I was so excited. God says, I'll give you 10 percent. You give them 12, 15 and you give this and you have 90 percent. And I, because of your 10 percent, you have way more than what you ever had. And all I asked you for was this. Give me this. It's better than flipping a house, y'all. <laughs> Because God gives, God says, I just need a little bit to work with. So when we give God just a little bit to work with, God always asks us for a little bit and everything that he asks for. He doesn't ask for the monumental things. When you look at the faith, the grain of the size of a mustard seed, he says, I don't need you to have big faith. And folks are running around trying to have big faith. He said, I just need you to take that that you got, that grain of a mustard seed. And when you really look at that, God's not asking for a lot. God's not really asking you for a lot. We feel like God is requiring so much of us. He said, I'm really not. Because when you just take that first step of obedience, I'm going to add to you. So when we're, when we're burned out, we have to start going back to that, where, what, what's going on. Let me face this thing and let me see what's really going on with me. So money is put into risky investments that turn sour and everything is lost. And in the end, there is nothing left to pass on to your children. Our children are left back here to bury us. And, you know, it, it bothers me when I go to a funeral. Do what you want to do. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. You've had to ask everybody to pitch in. You've done a GoFundMe, but the program looks like a souvenir book. Come on, y'all. We got to have people walking slow uh, like robots down the aisle. That costs extra. So why would we put all of our money into a dead place? You got to have a special casket. It's going to go in the ground and they're going to say ashes to ashes and throw dirt on it. I'm not saying don't honor mama and daddy. But if you know that you had to ask somebody for help, you really probably ought to opt for a graveside. And you know, COVID taught us that because you weren't doing anything but gravesides at one point. But we get into this mindset because somebody else did it and they crowned their cousin, they crowned their child. And now we got to go get a big prom dress to put our teenage daughter in. We got to do all this stuff. But we never, who builds a house, Luke says, and doesn't count the cost. Is it necessary to put all that stuff in the ground? We got to have flowers all the way around, but we don't give people a thank you, Je thank you, Jesus, you're in my life, or I appreciate you for who you are. I'm telling you as a pastor, don't give me a lot of flowers because I don't really care for flowers anyway. They're going to die. I don't, I don't, don't put a bunch of flowers across when I'm dead and gone. Find a scholarship fund. If I have someone in my family who needs or I, a cause, Help with that. But we put all that money out there. We put all that money out there and we're wasting it. And for what? We're not helping the living to live beyond the grave. I'm not being mean. I just want us to start. The rich and the wealthy don't do that. We do that because we feel like we, we're living out of our void and we feel like we got to prove something to somebody. And we hear something. Oh, they sure did put their daddy away nice. What is that? If I didn't cuss them out, I put them away nice. I put them away nice. So we have to think about these things. Let's go to Isaiah 23 and 18. Isaiah 23 and 18. New Living Translation. But in the end, her profits will be given to the Lord. Her wealth will not be hoarded, but will go but provide good food and fine clothing for the Lord's priest. So what are we doing? Are we looking for a harvest? Or are we looking to hold on to it? Bless somebody else. Bless somebody else. Have a heart to give. Have a heart to say, you know what? I want to I wanna sow into this because I, tr I trust God. Somebody asked me the other week, they said, you giving me this? I said, yeah. And so they said, I can't believe it. And then I said, well, and I, I, I stopped and then she got it. And she, she responded back and she said, you mean to tell me God has answered my prayer like this? We're helping other people to really believe that God hears them. I didn't know she had prayed. I just know that the Lord told me, do this and get it done. 
So it was, I left out of my garage, went back into my bedroom and sent the cash out because whatever I was doing wasn't important. I needed to get it off of me because I needed to make sure that I was clear and had done what I needed to do. When I got back to the phone, she could not believe it. But that helped her because her faith was increased because she had been asking God to do a quick work, and there it is. Had I delayed any longer with the test, I could have forgotten what God told me to do. Had good intention, but would have forgotten. But God, want, God says, no, I need you to stop what you're doing and go get that done now. We tend to get offended when God says, I need, that's not important right now. I know you want to finish that, but this is what I need you to do right now. We have to learn obedience. Because that helped her faith. That helped her faith. Go to James 5 and 3. We're still talking about hoarding versus your harvest. And a lot of people think they have a harvest, but you don't have a harvest. You just got stuff that's cluttered up and you got to start going through this stuff. Because if it's not helping you or anybody else, clothes. So what if they look brand new? If you haven't worn them, it's time to get rid of them and bless somebody who doesn't have clothes on their back. Doesn't have shoes. If it's a possibility you can get another one, give that one away. So James 5 and 3 says, your gold and your silver are corroded. This is why you want to want to keep that stuff. Have you ever seen silver when you have you haven't brought it out in a long time? You got to clean that stuff and rub on it real good because it changes over time. That that's that that gold even it starts to look a little bit weird, and you got to take your time and you got to pull get you know pull it out and clean that jewelry, right? It says your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. Have you ever put something on and you're like, I'm usually not allergic to gold. But now it's itching and all of a sudden you got this, this metal problem. Mm -hmm. So it's corroding away your flesh. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. So this is why we don't want to get caught up and just holding on to stuff. I, just to say, I got it. Or, I, or to look like we're meeting the status quo. Our church is really getting ready to go green. We're going to be a part of the Green the Church initiative, right? Because we, we understand that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and they that dwell within. Everything belongs to God. But God gave you and I the responsibility of stewarding of storing. We go out into our parking lot. We don't put the trash out there, but I pick it up because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You know, things that we see need to be done. We take care of it. Why? Because we say that this is the kingdom of God. How do you think about the kingdom of God? Remember, remember Solomon? Remember how his team came out? They were not perfect, but they had a spirit of excellence. Excellence and perfection are not the same thing. Excellence says that I'm going to go forth to do what God has blessed me, talented me to do, and what I've got the capacity to do, what I'm anointed to do. They were arrayed, and it took the very breath out of the queen of Sheba. When she came, she said they were so, they were so ready. They were prepared. It was the ambiance of preparation and excellence and presentation all in the same place. They were ready. She didn't make an announcement, I'm coming. So this is the way that they were because they had what in their hearts? Expectation. They had a level of expectation. And you will not have expectation if you don't embrace a vision or if you don't buy in. You will not have it. If you, How can I tell if I'm tied to a vision? I will have a level of expectation that things are going to go to the next level. I will not speak negative. I will not think negative. When I see something that is not going toward the vision, that's not negative. What that is, is seeing the reality. But what I do as a result of that says if I have buying in the vision. It says that now I'm going to say, well, what can I do to steer that vision so that it becomes at the end what God wants it to be? We all have that responsibility. That's why we have a we culture in our church and not an I and they and a y'all and them culture. We have a we culture. Because we understand that together, bearing Whatever we need to bear, we can get it done. Proverbs 11, 24 through 25. We're going to start talking about stinginess versus success or just stuff, having stuff, stuff versus success. A lot of people equate that if they have stuff, stuff that they're successful. I got a big house, it's 3,000 plus 
or more square feet. I've got to have an upstairs house in order to be successful. That is not what success looks like, saints of God. Success is not how big your house is. That's not success. That is not success. The type of car you drive is not success. If you've got labels on your clothes, that does not constitute success. Clean clothes are more important than name brand clothes. You got a Gucci, you got a Louis Vuitton, you got a, all this stuff, and you have no money in it. You should never carry a purse that you can't carry the value of that purse at all times in that purse. So that, that rules some of us out. Why are we carrying that purse? So we have to have, a, I, I've been there, but we have to have a mindset change because status says that I like this. So you start and social media, there's a, there's a, there's a and I, I'll put it on our social media pages, but there's a Netflix um, show documentary that talks about living your life as a minimalist. And how we don't have to have this, we don't have to have that. But what we do need, we can have it. Really looking at timings and really saying, God, what's the timing for this? But, you know, we got to have this because somebody says that we have to have it. When you really get out of that mindset, you'll start to look at stuff and say, that's really ugly to me. Or I really didn't like that. So you say, why did I get it? I got it because somebody else wanted me to have it. Or because I thought, it, or either they didn't want me to have it, but I thought it was necessary to fit in that crowd, so I bought it. Is a dress not that same dress just because they hurried up and they got it first and you got it the next year on sale? It's the same dress. The fibers in it don't change unless y'all different sizes. They just got more fabric than you got. But I promise you that thing started out at the same price. Yeah. We have to learn how to shop and then bargain shopping because I got caught up in that. I'm a bargain shopper. But still, just because it's on sale does not mean that I got to have it. So do I? So now we're starting to look at usefulness. Who can I bless? Do I know anybody that needs this right now? No, I don't. Let me leave that. For the next person who does know somebody, leave that thing on the shelf for them. Why do we have this? What am I doing? So we got to stop equating success in the world, especially with African-American people, because dollars go out of our community so fast in the Jewish community. It stays for days. In the black community, it goes out in hours, minutes. Dollars are leaving our community. And so you hear the initiative to buy, buy black. It's not so that... We're saying that we won't buy white or we won't buy Asian or we won't buy this, but we understand that there's a dilemma where money leaves out our community. So if we're gonna have community and be grounded and have something to give to the next generation, we buy black. That's what that means. It's not a prejudice it's, it's because I think we need to clear that up. A lot of people think, oh, well, they just wanna buy black products. No, that's not what it is. It's really being able to establish that community and have some longevity so that black people can be able to leave for their children's children and in inheritance, not giving up our property. Because, we, because when the mall comes or when the railroad comes, a lot of times they want to put that stuff through our property. Have you noticed that? They don't build highways through other communities. But we get so hungry and we're so starved that we tend to just buy into it. And if you really know how little you're getting for what the, the abundance that they really have that they can give you out of it, you'll stop selling your property. Property is a big thing for us. I got to say that again. Get some property. If you're going to have anything, make sure you have some property, some family property that you can pass on to the generations and put some clauses in there. If you know you got folks that you might die and they don't have good sense, put a clause in there that they can't sell it, but they got to have that property. They can grow things and utilize the property, plant trees. In a couple of years, the next generation is going to cut it down and they got lumber. But we got to learn how to prepare and plan for the future. Here in Proverbs 11, 24 through 25, it says the world of the generous gets larger and larger. This is the message Bible. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller because money is going to run away from you. It's not attracted to you when you're stingy. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. If you never want to help anybody, you're always in a hurry. 
It's always about you. You got a bad attitude. You know what? That's going to go on to the generations that follow you. I talk about it. I won't talk about it much tonight. But my father was a generous person. So there have been places I've walked in since he's been gone to glory. And people have seen the last name and they've said, I want to bless you. I want to do something for you. Because when you help people, that too goes on to the generation. So people of God, let me tell you, it does not always come in money. It'll come back and you didn't have to pay for that. It'll come back and you're like, what? And you'll be so happy that today we're having some things done in the church today that we got, the only thing we got to do is give a donation letter. It's like, hurry up, we're going to give this donation letter because it could be coming out of our pockets. We could be paying for the labor and the cost the materials but because we're grateful we're grateful so you have to understand that that it does not always come back in money sometimes it's going to come back in that good deed good deeds are worth everything and that's why you want to do good good deeds are going to be something that we're going to need in the time of famine because you might have to have somebody that says come live over here remember when um katrina happened People were letting people stay in their rent houses for free when floods happened and the calamities. So let's look at Luke 12. I told you we were going to go to Luke. We have two more scriptures. Luke 12 and 15 in the New American Standard, when we're talking about stuff versus success, it says, but he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. Every form of greed. For not even when one is a, for not even when one is affluent does he does his life consist of his possessions so if i'm an affluent man or a woman being affluent or being said to be known for doing great things or whatever it may be that gets you affluence or success has nothing to do with your stuff President Carter, former President Carter, gives his life at this age. He won't die. Every time he gets toward sickness, he comes back. You know why? Because that man gives. He builds houses. Look up, look up, look him up. Look him up. He's constantly giving. He wasn't that person when he was in office. And then he got out of office and it's like, pay me the rest of my life and help me. No, 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 no. He actually demonstrates what it is to be what's said in America. But you know why? Because he's a Christian. At his age, still giving, not complaining about it. Could be, and very well be, could be being served. But he serves without complaint. Not asking for anything in return. That's real success. That's real success. Finally, Proverbs 28 and 22 in the Message Bible. Finally, a miser in a hurry, a miser in a hurry to get rich doesn't know that he'll end up broke. I got to hurry up and get to the church. I got to hurry up, get to work. I got to, why? I got to hurry up and get home. I got to hurry up and get to the store. For what? I tell people this all the time, and, and a lot of people don't get it. If you don't have time to do something right the first time, what makes you think you're gonna have to have you're gonna have time to do it over when you don't do it right the first time to correct it? So take your time and do it right the first time. But you know what makes us do things right the first time when we're cheerful? I find that I'm gonna make mistakes. When I'm when I'm when I'm trying to do too many things and move too many parts, I'm gonna make mistakes. So, really having the grace to say, let me deal with this right now, let me do that, and let me do it well. John Hines says Henry Hines says this. Henry Hines, you can sit on ketchup bottles sometimes to learn to do a, a common thing uncommonly well. It's success, but we're trying to find a big invention, a big thing. But do that common thing uncommonly well, whatever it is that God has gifted you to do. And that will be success. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise you and we bless you and we thank you tonight.
Thank you because in your word there is life. We bless you and we repent for where we have hoarded, we have kept stuff, we have equated our success not to your, your judgment. We realize now that success is according to how you judge us for how we utilize our gifts and our times and our, our time and our talent. That's true success when you judge well and say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That is success, God. And so we're, we're working toward that success here in the earth. And we just ask that you forgive us of all of our sins and create within us clean hearts and renew the right spirit within us. That we will be cheerful in our doing, cheerful in our giving. We repent because we've not always approached serving and doing the work that you want us to do with this type of behavior. Help us to be cognizant and conscious of how we're doing the work. And God, we just ask, we thank you that you have not chosen to destroy us, but you love us so much that you correct us. And for that, we are so grateful. God, we ask now that you will continue to keep our eyes on the prize and keep us sturdy in our faith and in our walk. Where we need that clarity, we pray that you will declutter our hearts, declutter our minds, declutter the, the places of our lives that we are walking around. God, the rooms that we don't even know are cluttered in. But we know if you live in our heart that you'll do an overhaul. So we thank you for it. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.